you. And our readings today come from Psalm 121 and a letter to Timothy. Rachel's going to read to us now. Thanks, Rachel. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And a hymn which was um, sung at Helen and Jeff's wedding, uh, The Lord is My Shepherd from Psalm 23. Let's stand and sing together. Please be seated. I wonder how many of us here uh, enjoyed hearing Helen's stories. Uh, they were extraordinary accounts of uh, a life that was full of uh, amazing events, the things that she witnessed, the things she did, 
the things that brought her to live here in New Zealand. And so now we're going to hear some of those stories and some of the things that were characteristic of her relationships with her family. So I'm going to invite uh, Stuart to speak and then Robin and Geoffrey. those memoirs. Mum had written her memoirs too. Sadly, she never completed them. But what she has written is a very detailed and interesting account of her life, her earlier years in particular. One of the biggest differences between Mum's memoirs and those of Dad's is that whereas Dad's are 46 pages long, Mum's are 237 pages. <laughs> so, Page one. <laughs> Are you all comfortable? <laughs> Mum was Scottish. I don't imagine that comes as a surprise to all of you who knew her. I think, if nothing else, it was her accent that gave it away. Despite all the years she lived in New Zealand, she never lost it. Mum loved the Scottish dialect, particularly Glaswegian slang. She considered it couldn't be beaten for its descriptiveness. As children, we grew up with many Scottish words and phrases. A cow was a coo. Trousers were breeks. Potatoes were totties. Dust was stoor. Left-handed people were said to be curry-fisted. Instead of saying, I don't know, she would say, I dinny ken. <laughs> if we weren't feeling well, we were told we were looking a wee bit peely-welly. <laughs> if we were being noisy, we were not told to be quiet. Rather, we were told to hud your wished. If we got caught in the rain, we weren't soaked to the bone, we were fair drooked. She would often say, good gear gangs into small books, meaning good things are wrapped up in small parcels. But two of her favourite sayings were glaked gomeral and boar heated stirk. Now, an exact translation of these words is not easy, and even Google will struggle with it. But a good example of a boar-headed stirk would be the likes of Donald Trump. <laughs> or, in other words, a complete and utter idiot. <laughs> Fortunately, or at least as far as I can remember, she never referred to any of us in that manner. <laughs> but Mum was extremely proud of her Scottish heritage. Even though she ultimately lived the majority of her life in New Zealand, I think she always considered Scotland to be home, or hame, as she would call it. And there is no doubt that that Scottish influence has uh, rubbed off on me a little bit. Despite her size, Mum could be feisty and certainly wasn't scared to give her opinion. She had strong views on many things. For example, music. Basically, any music that evolved since the Second World War was considered to be modern music, and in most cases was a racket. However, there were exceptions. And in latter years, I introduced her to the music of the Scottish duo, The Corries, which she liked very much, and whose music we are using for part of this service. One of the tunes may seem an unusual choice for a funeral, but Mum specifically requested it years ago. She loves Scottish music, and of course, bagpipes. Art. Mum had very strong opinions on what she considered to be good art. In 2016, we were in Wellington for the Edinburgh Military Tattoo. Whilst there, we visited Te Papa Museum and ended up in the art gallery. We were staring at, of all things, a Colin McCann painting. <laughs> you know what's coming, don't you? When this lady came alongside and asked us what we thought of it, it turned out she was the curator. <laughs> Mum turned to her and without any hesitation said, I think it is absolute rubbish and if I had it at home, I would burn it. <laughs> For some reason, the lady didn't ask our opinion of any other paintings. <laughs> but
But for several years after that, it created much hilarity around the dinner table whenever Colin McCann's name was mentioned and watching Mum's reaction to it. We even threatened to buy her a Colin McCann calendar so she would have a new painting to look at each month. But I have to say, her opinion of the painting was very apt. Mum had trained as a teacher in Scotland. In those days, job opportunities for women were essentially limited to teaching, nursing, or working in a bank. After several years teaching, Mum decided to immigrate to New Zealand. And so on the 29th of August, 1957, Mum boarded the ship, the Brisbane Star. Her brother, Robert, who was with us here today, was a chief engineer on the Blue Star Line, and he had recommended travelling on a cargo ship as they carried just 12 passengers, as opposed to the liners, which were very crowded. Mum enjoyed every moment of her time aboard the ship. Apart from anything else, she had never seen so much food. She had endured 15 years of food rationing between 1940 to 1955, so you can imagine what a glorious sight it must have been to see such an array of food. In the six weeks she took to travel here, she gained half a stone, which is slightly over three kilos. Now that may not sound a lot, but considering her weight before boarding was five stone 12 pounds, or in other words, 35 kilos, it was quite significant. Mum arrived in Wellington on the 1st of October. She was 12,000 miles from home, alone and without a job, as she had to pass a medical examination before being allowed to teach. This she duly did, and by the end of October, she gained a teaching position at Tikahonga School, of all places. Mum admitted she had no idea what awaited her, but by the same token, I think it's probably true to say that the students didn't either. <laughs> there were two things that Mum had zero tolerance for, laziness and bad behaviour. At the school, she found there was no discipline, no books, no curriculum, no syllabus, and she considered what was essentially a useless headmaster. Despite having taught at some very tough schools in Scotland, Mum had never seen or had never experienced anything like it. But she considered herself lucky in the sense she had a small class, just 29 children. But they climbed in and out of windows, the noise was unbelievable, and on her first day some of the pupils were running over the desks. But they only did it once. Mum had brought her Scottish strap with her, and the students were warned of the consequences of disobedience. They quickly learned to walk in, walk out, sit in rows, and make no noise. One student thought he would do as he pleased and ran over the desk. He refused to take his punishment and jumped out the window. He returned three days later, found that his punishment still awaited him, and extra for exiting through the window. After a week, the headmaster said to her, you know, Miss Craig, you can have the children too quiet. To which Mum replied, they are here to learn, not to do as they pleased. Although many parents pleaded for her to stay, Mum was just there for seven weeks before accepting a position to teach at Clevedon School, where she started teaching on the 4th of February 1958. She had a standard one class of over 40 pupils. I think it would be fair to say that Mum was a formidable teacher, but a highly respected one. Although she was strict and would accept no nonsense, she loved teaching. Like any good teacher, she would encourage her class to learn and reach their full potential. I know some of her former pupils are here today, and I'm sure they would agree. Unless, of course, they were the badly behaved ones. <laughs> when Mum got married, she became a housewife, but she never lost the teaching instinct. Rob and Jeff and I were all taught to read, write, and count before starting school. As there was not the availability of preschool books that there is today, she would stay up late at night preparing all the work for our lessons. In the case of myself, Mum soon realised that I was left-handed, or I suppose I should say curry-fisted. So on the day I started at Clevedon School, she told the headmaster, under no circumstances were they to try to force me to become right-handed, or they would have her to answer to. <laughs> Needless to say, I am still left-handed. Mum was never idle. She had a wide range of hobbies, gardening, knitting, dressmaking, embroidery, cake decorating. Her work was meticulous. An example of her embroidery is the pulpit cloth in front here, which she completed in 1976. In 1980, it was on display at the Waikato Art Museum in the first exhibition of ecclesiastical embroidery in New Zealand. 
Unfortunately, it is starting to show signs of wear and tear. Mum loved books and was an avid reader, and of course, there was her cooking. I think it would be fair to say it was legendary. The cake tins were always full. Anyone who visited would be inundated with a wide selection of home baking and probably left feeling a few kilos heavier. For several years, she made the cake for the church's anniversary service. It was always admired and well-liked, no doubt partially due to the cup of brandy that was included in the cake mixture. <laughs> Mum had a great sense of humour, was quick-witted, and loved talking to people. There was no such thing as a short conversation with Mum. Whether people were phoning or visiting, they had to be prepared to allow for a significant amount of time. But the conversations were always interesting and interspersed with much laughter. I'm not going to disregard the last few years of Mum's life. Mum had dementia, and it is a cruel disease. I know that adjective can be applied to many illnesses, but the dementia simply deprived her of any enjoyment in her final few years. At a time in her life when she could have relaxed and enjoyed her many hobbies, she was denied that opportunity. But even as the dementia progressed, as far as I was concerned, she was still mum. And there weren't many days when I couldn't get her to smile, share a laugh, or see that twinkle in her eye, which was so characteristic of her. At times, caring for her wasn't easy, and yes, occasionally, it could be frustrating. But in many respects, it was a privilege. It was an opportunity to provide her with the love and support that she so willingly gave to us throughout the years. Robin and Paul next door were a great support and probably helped me maintain my sanity, or maybe that was Paul's cocktails, <laughs> and Jeff kept in regular contact from Australia. But there is no doubt whatsoever that a huge thank you needs to be given to the entire team at the county's Manukau Healthcare Trust, and in particular to Mary, Jill and Kerry, and I know Mary and Jill are here today. Don't worry, I'm not going to get you to come up. It's, it's quite daunting up here, believe me. Um, Without your assistance, the ability to keep mum at home would have been an incredibly arduous job. I know at times mum may not have shown her full appreciation. I don't, well, I lost count of the number of times she told Kiri to shut up. <laughs> but I think mum just had an inherent fear of losing her independence. The family, and in particular myself, are extremely grateful for the care and support you all provided to mum. And certainly in the last few weeks, there was no hesitation at all to increase the level of assistance as mum's condition deteriorated. After what had been a long life, in many respects an interesting life, and at times a life of hardship, mum passed away peacefully at home where she felt most comfortable. We consider that in itself to be a great blessing. If I had to choose one word to describe mum, I would say she was a perfectionist. No matter what she did, it always had to be of an extremely high standard. Anything less was considered to be unacceptable. And that attribute of striving to achieve one's best, I consider she has instilled in all three of us, and in her grandchildren too. I think her one failing, and admittedly it's not a major one, was her inability to master the use of a mobile phone. <laughs> we never really achieved that, did we, Mum? Somehow, I think it would have required an eternity, and sadly, we just ran out of time. Thank you. This is taken from Mum's memoirs, and there are powerful memories of her early life, stories that we often heard. Mum was born on the 18th of April, 1929, in a tenement house above a chemist in Paisley, Scotland. Daughter of Robert and Ellen Craig, and little sister to Robert here. Robert, who was then one year and 10 months old, was evidently extremely jealous of his little sister. Apparently, he would not eat and became very weak, which resulted in a nurse neighbour advising a little brandy. This was duly purchased and evidently provided the cure. Perhaps, Uncle Robert, this accounts for your lifelong love of a wee tipple that you still enjoy. 
This may also account for 80 years later when our daughter Helen was extremely unwell with glandular fever. And I left Helen with, I thought, my responsible mother. I was rather aghast to come home and find that she had given Helen whiskey and honey for morning tea. <laughs> Mum, with a mischievous smile, assured me it was purely medicinal. Needless to say, within 24 hours, Helen had made a remarkable recovery. <laughs> Mum started school in 1934. The schools were grim, stone buildings with iron railings all around, concrete, no grass, boys had their playgrounds and girls had theirs. There were wooden desks, slate, slate pencils, and later there was ink and ink wells, pens and an ink rag to clean the pen nibs. They lined up in the playground and woe betide any latecomers who weren't in line when the bell stopped ringing. Around 1937, the Craig family moved to another tenement building and lived on the top floor about 50 feet above the ground. The houses were a lounge, kitchen and scullery. The beds were in a bed recess and to wash, water was boiled in a kettle and they washed in a basin. Their hair was washed with red carbolic soap and rinsed in vinegar to make it shine. There were no fancy shampoos or conditioners and the pipes froze in winter. There was a coal range in the kitchen used for cooking and heating the house. This had to be blackleaded and the seals polished until they shone every week. The wash houses were shared in the close and there were two days a fortnight when each household could use the wash house. All washing, the ringer, washboard, soap, etc. had to be carried down, the copper lit, water boiled, washing done, all scrubbed by hand on the washing board and put through the ringer. It was then hung out to dry. In winter, it would freeze solid and crack when taken down. It all was carried up again and put on the pulley in the kitchen to dry, which could take days. There were six flights of steps to negotiate. Mum would quite literally run up and down these, two at a time, with her bike over her shoulder. Mum excelled at school. She was ducks and won multiple prizes. She especially loved mental arithmetic. And her teacher said, if Helen doesn't know it, no one does, and if Helen can't do it, no one can. She was one of five girls in her college year to study physics, chemistry, and higher maths. She well remembered Sunday the 3rd of September 1939 when the announcement came over the radio that war had been declared. Mum was 10, her mother wept. They were issued with identity cards, ration books, and gas masks. Windows were made safe with sticky tape and people went to great lengths to do different designs. Windows had to be blacked out, baffle walls were built on the pavements outside the closes to prevent blasts, and the closes were reinforced with metal pillars and beams to support the buildings and offer some protection to the tenants who could either sit in these drafty freezing spaces or go to the air raid shelters nearby. While at first things seemed normal, food started to become scarce. All food had to be queued for, and everything was rationed until 1955. It was mum's job to do the shopping, to queue at the butchers, the grocers, with coupons for everything, butter, sugar, eggs, bacon, tinned food, and then queuing at the bakers for bread. Mum and Robert were not allowed fruit as they were over five years old, and only those under five got bananas. At the vegetable shop, the lady would hide three or four bananas under the potatoes for them. If it had ever been discovered, she would have been in an awful lot of trouble. The rations didn't last a week. When there was no meat for dinner, they had saps. This was bread sprinkled with sugar and hot milk. <coughs> they, got, <coughs> excuse me, they got one egg each per week, often only one per fortnight. Her mother would save her egg for her father as he worked long hours, and Robert and Mum would give their mother the tops off their boiled eggs. Breakfast and lunch was a fried scone. Her father reckoned the fat ration was tallow. It tasted so awful. But pig trotters and pork bones were not rationed. Her father would get them at the back door of the bacon curer. The girl in the shop would slip him some to avoid the long wait in the queue. They made delicious soup and they got the trotters to eat. Mum had a lifelong love of trotter soup. She would go to bed every night reading a cookery book in bed, reading about all the delicious food they could have if only they had the ingredients. At the start of the war, they had a large tin of John West salmon which for some reason her parents said they would open to celebrate when the war ended. They did that, 
only to find it had gone bad. There were many raids and alarms. The sirens would sound, and they slept in their clothes, ready to run if need be. Her mother had a little leather case that mum has kept that held their insurance papers, bank books, ration books, and identity cards. On March the 13th, 1941, the Germans bombed Clyde Bank. From the tenement window, they would see some six miles or so across to Clyde Bank. Her father used to hold her up to see the big clock in the Singer Sewing Factory, which was lit up at night. That night, her father was out with the home guard on the ACAC guns. Robert had gone to scouts, and mum and her mother were alone when the sirens went. They never went down to the reinforced close, except once later, as her mother reckoned if they got hit, it was better to go down with the building than be buried under it. On that night, they looked out the tenement window. They witnessed the destruction of Clyde Bank. It was a sea of fire. Over 200 German bombers dropped incendiaries and high explosive bombs, and over 1,000 were killed. The blast was so great that the clothes hanging in the lobby in their tenement were jumping with the vibrations. They didn't know if they would be next, where her father was, or Robert, as he stayed at the scout hall all night, sleeping in a disused fireplace. And then in May 1941, there were the worst raids. Her mother was persuaded to go to the shelter. Two landmines had already been dropped. As they went down to the first landing, they stood and looked out the big window. Mum clearly remembered it was a beautiful, moonlit night, almost like day. Suddenly, a parachute appeared, and Robert yelled, a German paratrooper. But her father said, run, run for your life, it's a landmine. They got down six steps when the whole tenement shook. The windows blew in, the glass from the window they had been standing at flew over their heads. The noise was deafening. Later, they found out it was a direct hit on an air raid shelter, which was in Woodside Cemetery, about 150 metres from them. It killed 93 people, doctors, teachers and nurses who were there to help the victims. As children, Mum and Robert played cops and robbers on bikes. Mum enjoyed cycling around and one day wanted to cycle to Glen Lee or to visit an aunt, which was about 20 miles away. Her father thought it was too, go too far to go, but she cycled around the town just to prove she could do it about 20 miles. So Robert accompanied her to Glen Lee. However, Mum hadn't reckoned on hills, pouring rain and cold. She froze on the bike and Robert had to push her up the hills. Arriving at her aunt's house in Glen Lee, they had to lift her off the bike and she had to stay overnight as she was in no fit state to ride back. She learned her lesson. From 1946 to 1949, Mum went to Jordan Hill Teacher Training College in Glasgow. She hated it when they had lecturers come and watch them teach and be criticised. Her main fault was she looked too young to be a teacher. One advantage to this was that when she went with her friends to the cinema, she got in for half price, and they shared the few pence saved. On entering Jordan Hill, Mum had a medical exam. She weighed five and a half stone or 35 kilos. The doctor tapped the scales with his foot as he assumed they had stuck, then called in another doctor. They came up with a suggestion, she eat more porridge. During the holiday, she got a job with the Paisley Town Council in the rates department for one shilling an hour, five days a week and Saturday mornings. She was working out water rates to four decimal points of a penny and writing notices. For 44 hours in the week, she got two pounds, four shillings. The men got double the pay the women got, even though mum could turn out 500 notices to their 250. So she always felt she should have got the double pay. Mum's first teaching job at age 20 in 1949 was at Fergusie School in Paisley. She had a class of seven-year-olds with 54 pupils. Her wages were about four pounds a week. Fergusie Park was a large housing estate, regarded to this day as the worst housing estate in Paisley. And while some pupils came from good homes where they were well cared for, many came from very poor homes with all the problems associated with this. The attendance officer was sent to the home of one pupil playing truant. Unbeknownst to mum, the parents had separated, and the mother, who was afraid she would lose custody of the daughter, chased the attendance officer down the stairs with an axe. She then came to the school and raged at mum. And I quote, without the expletives as we're in church, a lot of scalps of things out to college teaching our wanes. It was a steep learning curve for mum dealing with these situations. There was some humour. Another pupil, always with a runny nose, was chastised by the headmistress who said, 
What is that on your sleeve, Willie? To which he replied, snotters, and carried on his way. In September 1950, they enrolled 65 five-year-olds in one morning, the result of the armed services returning from the war. The majority of them couldn't tie up their shoelaces or do up buttons. In 1954, teachers were notified they could be x-rayed to check for tuberculosis. If found to have it, they would get one year full pay and six months half pay. Mum wasn't going to go. She had never, she'd been teaching five and a half years and never missed a day, and she hadn't seen a doctor since 1942 when she had appendicitis. However, her colleagues thought they should go, and after all, as good Scots, it was free. So she went with two colleagues laughing about one year off work if they had it. It was all a great joke. The 31st of January, 1955, at age 26, was the day she said her world stopped. She got a call from the chest clinic asking her to return that afternoon. There was something they wanted to check out. The others in the staff room tried to reassure her all was well. She was the healthiest one among them. It would just be a blurred x-ray. Further x-rays and other tests were done and mum was told she had tuberculosis in her right lung. The doctor said she would be off work a year, at least a year, and six months in a sanatorium. She didn't remember leaving the building, but found herself at Paisley Cross, thinking how much easier it would be just to step under a bus. She said TB meant a lingering death. It was rife in the west of Scotland, and indeed in Fergusley School. Just a few weeks before, a grandmother of one of her pupils had told her theirs was the only house in a block of four with no tuberculosis and each block on either side had one or more cases in each house. They called it the killer disease. She cried for two days. The outcome was mum got a choice to either go to a sanatorium outside Paisley or go to Switzerland. It would cost one pound for her passport and the newly established NHS would cover the rest. She had no hesitation choosing Switzerland. So on March 11, 1955, she went on a plane for the first time in her life to, and flew to Zurich, then went by bus to Laysan. Sanatorium Mont Blanc was 4,500 feet up the mountain. Previously, before effective drugs had been found, wealthy patients had gone there hoping for a cure in the lovely mountain air. There was a death a day. Mum had a balcony in her room where she could look out to the mountains. She said that to her, it was the most beautiful place. The scenery was beyond imagination. The air was so clean, no fog or dirt. To return to teaching, mum had to be cured of tuberculosis. During the eight months she spent in the sanatorium, the treatment involved 85 injections of streptomycin, three a week injected into their bottoms, which were black and blue with bruising. Additionally, they had 36 tablets a day, 180 in the week to take for five days and none at weekends. The nurse brought the tablets around in a huge container and just tipped a quantity into a bedside container. It was up to the patients to take the required number. They had meals in bed and were not allowed up and about as they had to rest as much as possible. They had two hours silent time every day. <clears throat> the staff at mum's school could not understand how she could keep quiet for so long. <laughs> then came another huge shock. The doctors told her that as she was a teacher, <clears throat> Excuse me. And the, doc <clears throat> Excuse me. the doctors told her that as she was a teacher and had to be cured properly, she was to have a stage one thoracoplasty on her right side. This involved removing ribs to permanently collapse the lung under local anaesthetic. So she was moved to Belvedere, a huge sanatorium just below them on the mountain. On June the 25th, she was given two tablets to swallow and walked to the operating theatre. She climbed onto a table and local anaesthetic was injected up her front and down her back. Then she was strapped down. One of the nurses held her hand. She remembered the cut being made and heard the first rib cracking before she passed out. Altogether, she had four and a half ribs removed to permanently collapse her right lung. She returned to Sanatorium Mont Blanc and was not allowed to lie down for two months. The bed was raised and there was a huge nest of pillows. She was not allowed to knit or sew, only read and write letters. Once able to sew, 
Mum embroidered this tablecloth draped on her coffin today. It has heather, bluebells and thistles embroidered on it. It was first used at my 21st and then again at Mum's mother's 100th birthday. She had few visitors. Robert went over twice to see her and a cousin visited at once. She befriended the night nurse, Sister Ella, and they corresponded every year until Sister Ella's death in the late 90s. Mum and Dad visited Sister Ella in Switzerland in 1991, and there's a photo of that in the reflection. In November, she flew home to Scotland. She was still on chemotherapy and had another 1,000 tablets to take. She said to her GP that she had the doctors to thank, but he said no, she could thank the advancement of medical science, that a few years before they could have done nothing for her. For a young 26-year-old to endure this is a remarkable testament to a Scottish grit and determination, traits which have been passed down to us all, and I certainly see that grittiness and steely determination in the grandchildren. Mum returned to teaching in September 1956, 19 months after being diagnosed with TB. It was about this time that she seriously began to think about going to New Zealand. And as Stuart said, her first teaching position was Tikahonga and then to Clevedon. After she moved to Clevedon in February 1958, she boarded at the boarding house, which was where the wool shed now stands. Clevedon School was an improvement on Tikahonga, but still not up to Scottish standards. The headmaster told her she was the only teacher who kept records in alphabetical order. She wondered what other way could you possibly keep them? One inspector told her to teach less maths. And this was for children who were already behind in their learning. He altered her timetable. As soon as he left, she altered it back to what she had and what she deemed necessary to bring them up to standard. She said it was her class and she was responsible for the pupils. Mum was so used to parents ready to do battle with the teachers that the Clevedon attitude was a bit of a shock. Pleasant, polite parents who brought plates of delicious food for occasions at school. After six weeks in the boarding house, Mum went to stay with Shirley and Trevor Jones and was there until she married. Mum became friendly with Rita Fawcett, who one day took Mum to visit her sister-in-law, Minnie Lane. Her son, Jeff, opened the door and Mum thought, oh, he looks nice, but I, he's quite likely married with six children. He played some Scottish records for her that afternoon. Later that year, Jeff, or dad as he became, went big game hunting in Kenya. While there, he bought this brooch that I'm wearing for Mum, even though he had never asked her out. Clearly, he was quite a romantic optimist. In, 19, in August 1959, he finally asked her out, and four weeks later proposed. He said he got the biggest surprise of all when she said yes. It just showed how fed up she must have been with teaching. <laughs> Mum, on the other hand, had thought Dad would never get around to asking her out. <laughs> on telling family the engagement news the next day, Milton apparently wondered what on earth Uncle Jeff was doing with his teacher in the car when he turned up at Uncle Rex and Aunt Linda's house. <laughs> They were married in this church on December the 4th, 1959. In May that year, Mum had visited a friend of Shirley's, Granny Gilmore, who read Mum's teacup. Mum scribbled on a piece of paper, which she still has, what Granny Gilmore told her. She had seen the letters G and L, a tall, dark man. Within three months, big changes in her life. Well, it was three months later Dad proposed, or asked her out. And within six months, spending a lot of money and entering a brick building. And it was six months later they were married with all the expenses that entails and moving into Dad's brick house. But Mum remembered being disappointed to start with about the initials because she thought Jeff was spelt with a J. Of course, it was with a G, and she would tell Dad he never stood a chance as he was in her teacup. <laughs> Mum gave up teaching and became a farmer's wife. This was a total change of lifestyle. When she got engaged, Mrs Massey, whom she had stayed with while teaching at Tikahonga, asked her if Dad had an orchard, and said, poor you, when she replied that he did. Mum soon found out what she meant when Dad would bring the fruit round by the wheelbarrow full. She had never seen so much fruit, let alone tasted a fresh peach. When Mum left Paisley in 1957, peaches were two shillings and sixpence each, too expensive to buy. And here she was bottling 100 to 150 jars of peaches, pears, etc. every year, as well as jam to make and vegetables to freeze, etc. An annual pedigree jersey sale was held on the farm each year with Dad, Uncle Jim and Uncle Rex all selling pedigree jerseys. 
Mum remembered taking Geoffrey over when he was about seven months old. And as she walked past the prospective buyers, listening to the bloodlines and pedigrees of the bulls, there were three sisters, Ella, Frida, and Lily. And one of them said to her, where did a wee thing like you get such a fine fat baby? Their faces were a study when mum replied without batting an eye, it was a good bull. <laughs> mum was actively involved in this church on the cleaning roster, flower roster and teaching Sunday school to the children for many years. Of course, it's now the kids club. She detested the use of the word kids to describe children in any context. She would often say, children are children, kids are baby goats. At Sunday school, she would teach the children to sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, which is why we have chosen this hymn today. As Stuart said, Mum remained fiercely proud of her Scottish heritage. She would often say, there are two kinds of people in this world, the Scots and those that want to be. <laughs> I'd like to reiterate uh, Stuart's thank you for uh, everybody coming along today here to remember and uh, really celebrate mum, Mum's life. This is just a short personal reflection. Um, having now heard what Stuart and Robin have said, there's maybe some inherent overlaps, but um, I'll keep it brief. A life lived in way of a very, very succinct summary. Grew up in Paisley enduringly, proudly Scottish, experienced bombings in World War II, survived tuberculosis and related surgery, arrived in New Zealand by ship on her own to live and teach, got married, a mother to three, grandmother to five, nearly made 95 and becoming a great-grandmother. When relaying the news of Mum's passing to an old friend, they reminisced, relating their memory of Mum getting cakes out of a tin from the kitchen cupboard. This is no doubt a memory of many. Mum was a warrior in the kitchen. Meals were more than just made. The pantry more than just full of preserves. The cake tins were always well populated and of course, cake decorating was a favorite activity. After doing night classes for a year in the 1970s, she took to it like a duck to water, or a better metaphor might be like icing to a cake. No subsequent special occasion lacked in fairly professional looking creations. A fond memory of childhood was being, was being engaged with elements of cooking. Um, uh, elements of cooking commensurate with our age, even of just licking the cake mixer beaters. Simply this was just mum bringing together her teaching skills with her love of cooking. And it gave us all some good life skills that have stayed with, with us. Even after several decades, cooking is still something to enjoy, and I still like licking the cake beaters. Mum was indeed the matriarch of the family, and the home was definitely her dominion. And how lovely for her, and this is where Stuart deserves uh, a special, special thanks. Um, a huge thank you for being mum's primary carer these past few years. And how lovely that mum was able to live out her days and pass peacefully sleeping in her home, in her own room. Nothing happened in the home without mum knowing about it. She was proudly in complete control of every aspect and had full knowledge of every inch. Although, I do recall secretly buying a clock radio for mum and dad's Christmas present at the end of a uni year. No one knew, perhaps Stuart sworn to secrecy if I recall, and the not insignificantly sized box was hidden away until revealed on Christmas day. The present was a pleasant enough surprise, but the fact that it had evaded mum's scrutiny for several weeks all but rendered her speechless no mean feat in its own right. A bold and intelligent woman, a no-nonsense teacher, 
a no-nonsense homemaker, a proud mother, a proud grandmother, a sister to Bob, meticulous, an individual, someone who did life on her terms. Like all of us, mum had her idiosyncrasies. They helped make her unique, who she was. She was, her, she was our mother, and she was my mum. sadness at her death, but perhaps also something else as well. Uh, it's hard to name, but perhaps in the complexity of our world, the ambiguities contained in a, in a thousand different choices, we, we find in Helen something deeply authentic and real and grounded, a, a kind of anchor point in our own lives and the life of this community. I'll just um, pick up my microphone, which is dropped down so you can hear me a little better. I'm sorry about that. There are, I think, aspects of Helen's life that remind us again about some of the things that we need to preserve or might even have neglected. Helen's resilience and grit, the centrality she placed on her faith, and how she grounded that faith in her everyday life. The importance in the quality, not only of relationships, but also the quality of things, the enduring quality of things. Things of beauty, except Colin McCann paintings, of course. <laughs> but also things that she created, the things made by hand. The importance of community, a place where people know our names, a place where we are recognised and a place where we are missed. Now, Helen's death focuses in a deep way on the things of life that are most important. And I was talking about these things uh, just a couple of days ago with Mark, my, my colleague in, in ministry. He was, Mark, as many of you will know, was the previous minister here for, for more than 40 years. And he, he spoke to me about how greatly he had valued the support and encouragement that Helen and Jeff had provided to him over those years of ministry. Mark particularly remembers how Jeff had been instrumental in Mark actually coming here. And given what we know of Helen, she wouldn't have been inclined to hold back her opinions. I'm sure she would have had a very significant role in influencing Jeff and the leadership that Jeff provided here. A psalm in the Bible uh, asks us, asks God to teach us to number our days that we may be given hearts of wisdom. And so today we think about our capacity to forgive, our ability to live lives of hope, our ability to see the best in others, to look beyond our own shortcomings and see the goodness in people's hearts, a readiness to listen and then be there for others to understand that everyone has their story. And so we give thanks for Helen's story today and how that story was so interwoven in the story of the gospel and the good news of God's love. So let's pause and give thanks in prayer. God, we give thanks for Helen's life. We pray that our memory of her will 
enrich our own lives, her strength, her courage, her love for Jeff, her robust faith. We give thanks for those who cared for Helen, for Stuart, for Robin, for Jeff, uh, and for the ways that their care um, was seen in, in almost sacrificial ways, supporting, encouraging, always being there for her. We think a mo for a moment about the things left unsaid. We think of words we might have spoken to Helen, but never uh, had the chance, perhaps. We think of what we might say to her now. God, help us to release these things to you and help us to give thanks that by your grace we discover what it means to be loved, what it means to be forgiven, and what it means to live and love and be the people you call us to be. We pause to pray for all people in need, and especially we pray for those who are suffering the effects of dementia and those who care for them. We pray for those who are afraid or angry, for those at war, for those who are in pain, for those who do not know peace. And we pray that we all will find comfort in another human being and that we will be people ready to support others in any need of theirs. God, we give thanks that you are with us now and always in life and in death. Amen. So as Robin has told us, we're going to sing the hymn that Helen taught her children at Sunday school, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Let's stand and sing together.
please be seated. Well, we um, have an opportunity now to reflect on uh, uh, Helen's life through some visual images. And uh, the song, I think, that's been played is one that um, she particularly chose for, uh, for, for this. What's the name of the song? It's the uh, Bricklayer's Song. The Bricklayer's Song. So... <laughs> There are bricks in the building here, I think. So let's uh, spend some time enjoying these images. Dear sir, I write this note to you to tell you of my plight. For at the time of writing it, I'm not a pretty sight. My body is all black and blue, my face a deathly grey. And I write this note to say why I am not at work today. While working on the 14th floor, some bricks I had to clear. But tossing them down from such a height was not a good idea. The foreman wasn't very pleased, he is an awkward sod. And he said I had to cart them down the ladders in me hod. Well, clearing all these bricks by hand, it was so very slow. So I hoisted up a barrel and secured a rope below. But in me haste to do the job, I was too blind to see that a barrel full of building bricks was heavier than me. And so when I untied the rope, the barrel fell like lead. And clinging tightly to the rope, I started up instead. I shot up like a rocket, and to my dismay I found that halfway up I met the bloody barrel coming down. Well, the barrel broke me shoulder as to the ground it sped. And when I reached the top, I banged the pulley with me head. But I clung on tightly, numb with shock from this almighty blow. While the barrel spilled out half its bricks some 14 floors below. Now when these bricks had fallen from the barrel to the floor, I then outweighed the barrel and so started down once more. But I clung on tightly to the rope, me body racked with pain. And halfway down, I met the bloody battle once again. <clears throat> the force of this collision, halfway down the office block, caused multiple abrasions and a nasty case of shock. But I clung on tightly to the rope as I fell towards the ground. And I landed on the broken bricks the barrel had scattered round. Well, as I lay there on the floor, I thought I'd passed the worst. But the barrel hit the pulley wheel, and then the bottom burst. A shower of bricks rained down on me, I didn't have a hope. As I lay there bleeding on the ground, I let go the bloody rope. <laughs> the barrel now being heavier, it started down once more. It landed right across me as I lay there on the floor. It broke three ribs in my left arm, and I can only say, I hope you'll understand why I am not at work today. Summer time has come 
And the trees are sweetly blooming The wild mountain tide Grows around the blooming heart Will you go, lassie, go And we'll all go together
Thank you. So now we proceed to uh, commit Helen into God's eternal care. We're moving out to the graveyard, to the cemetery now, and we're conscious too that um, moving to the cemetery, we're moving to um, Jeff's resting place, her loved husband, um, Helen's parents also there, and also generations of the Lane family. Uh, it's quite a, quite a group. Um, and we talk about these as the great cloud of witnesses in the Christian faith, a sense that we celebrate all those who have gone before us, but a sense too that their hopes, the things that they live for, are embodied in their children and their grandchildren. And I think we've seen real evidence of that this morning. So let's stand now as we move out to the, um, to the graveside.